straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Reaction pours in from across the country to Derek Chauvin's guilty verdict. What it means for George Floyd's family, friends, and his legacy. I'm not just fighting for George anymore. I'm fighting for everybody around this world. Yeah. The former police officer transferred to state prison. What was that writing scene on his hand? And when to expect his sentencing hearing? Eight weeks from now, we will have sentencing. Plus, the Department of Justice launching a new federal civil rights investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department. I strongly believe that good officers do not want to work in systems that allow bad practices. Law and Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome, everybody, to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Ross in our studios in New York, along with co-host Terry Austin and Brian Buckmeyer on assignment in Minneapolis for the trial of Derek Chauvin, where the verdict was guilty, guilty, guilty. And Brian was there for it all. Brian? Brian Ross, the verdict in the trial of Derek Chauvin was met with cheers throughout the streets just outside of the courthouse. Now, following those cheers the next two or three hours, we heard speeches from different religious and civil rights leaders talking about this was a moment of accountability. They said that justice was served, but justice was more of an ongoing process and that there was more work that needed to be done. We also heard from Minnesota Attorney General and President Joe Biden commenting on the verdict. And as you looked around the area, you saw that where there once was just a number of people having boards, plywood boards up on their storefronts, some people began to take those down, and we saw that occur throughout the night. One of the other things that we saw were also that the family of George Floyd commented on what they had seen. One of George Floyd's brothers had this to say after the verdict. You have the cameras all around the world to see and show what happened to my brother. It was a motion picture. The world seen his life being extinguished. And I could do nothing but watch, especially in that courtroom over and over and over again as my brother was murdered. Times, they're getting harder every day. Ten miles away from here, Mr. Wright, Dante Wright. That's right. Yeah. He should still be here. We have to always understand that we have to march. We will have to do this for life. We have to protest because it seems like this is a never-ending cycle. Yeah. yeah. Brian, the jury was out for just under 10 hours with 38 witnesses and all those videos to review. Were you surprised they were able to reach a verdict in that time? I was. I thought that just the breadth of the evidence in this case, as well as the complexity of some of the jury instructions, I always tell people, I went to law school for three years. I've practiced now for seven years. I understand how to read a jury verdict. And even I have difficulty in understanding other states' uh, definitions of terms or how they use jury instructions. And so to have someone or 12 someones have to sit there and learn the language, learn the evidence, master it, and come up with a verdict, especially a verdict that is so powerful for the county and the country, I thought we might have taken a little bit more time, but I'm not surprised based on the strength of the prosecution's case. All right. Thank Thanks, Brian. And now the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division is launching a new investigation into the practices of the Minneapolis Police Department. This is separate from the already ongoing federal criminal investigation into George Floyd's death. The investigation I am announcing today will assess whether the Minneapolis Police Department engages in a pattern or practice of using excessive force, including during protests. The investigation will also assess whether the MPD engages in discriminatory conduct and whether its treatment of those with behavioral health disabilities is unlawful. It will include a comprehensive review of the Minneapolis Police Department's policies, training, supervision, and use of force investigations. It will assess the effectiveness of the MPD's current systems of accountability and whether other mechanisms are needed to ensure constitutional and lawful policing. 
Terry Austin, this is a civil, not a criminal investigation. So, so what are the options the Department of Justice has in this case? So we're going to see this is going to be a very broad investigation of the entire Minneapolis Police Department. And what they are going to be looking at is all of their practices and patterns of practices using excessive force, discrimination. They're going to look at stops. They're going to look at seizures. They're going to look at protests. They said they're going to look at responses to calls with people who might have mental disabilities. So it's going to be comprehensive. And I think that not only are they going to look at these practices, but they're going to, as you heard Garland say right there, they're going to look at every single training and police policy. So it's going to be widespread. And I think other departments across the country are going to have to consider whether they might be next. And Brian, previous similar investigations of other police departments have had a mixed record of success. What do you think might be different this time? Or is it just mostly public relations? I think it's a little bit of both, actually. I think that we saw a case where the prosecution made it a point to say, we're only going after this officer and not the others. However, we often use the term, uh, it's just a few bad apples. And I always hate it because the actual phrase is, a few bad apples ruin the barrel or the bin because apples have the ability to spoil other apples close to them. So I think this investigation sees that they plucked out one bad apple, being Derek Chauvin, and now they're exploring the rest of the barrel to see if the other apples in that barrel have also gone rotten. Of course, we have three other officers who are going to be put on trial in August, and so I think this is the appropriate stance, but of course you have to balance that to make sure you don't prejudice those other upcoming state criminal cases. Much more to come, certainly, about what President Biden called yesterday systemic racism. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, witnesses who testified in the Derek Chauvin trial are speaking out what they have to say about Derek Chauvin's conviction. But first, the writing was on his hand. What was that on Derek Chauvin's hand, seen as he was cuffed and taken away by court bailiffs? We'll break it all down for you, coming up. The judge revoked Derek Chauvin's bail, and he was immediately taken into custody following the reading of the guilty verdicts. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here to tell us what life behind bars will look like for the former officer. Anjanette. Brian, typically a defendant is taken directly to the county jail after a conviction, but not this time. Derek Chauvin was taken straight to a prison here in Minnesota, likely for his own protection. Bail is revoked, bond is discharged, and the defendant is remanded to the custody of the Hennepin County Sheriff. Derek Chauvin placed his hands behind his back and Hennepin County Sheriff's deputies handcuffed him and walked him out of the courtroom. If you looked closely, you could see writing on one of Chauvin's palms. He was taken to Oak Park Heights, which is a prison with an administrative control unit. Photos from the Department of Corrections website show what it looks like inside. Chauvin is in segregation, away from other inmates for his own safety, and the prison claims it operates at the highest level of security. A police officer is not seen in a very good light in a prison setting. And I think a lot of them, they, they want to be able to make a name for themselves, have an opportunity to brush up against him in a hallway, in a chow hall, and have an opportunity to get their hands on him. In Chauvin's unit, inmates are checked every 30 minutes and allowed to have books and toiletries. They also undergo mental health exams if they will be there for more than 30 days. Eight weeks from now, we will have sentencing. Chauvin's lawyer declined a request for an interview, but issued a statement. Mr. Chauvin's case, including sentencing in approximately eight weeks, is still ongoing. As such, I will not be making a statement at this time. Derek Chauvin was booked into that prison short, uh, early Tuesday evening. It's not clear whether or not he will stay in that particular prison past sentencing, but it's likely his attorney will request some type of protective custody for him while he serves his time. Brian? And Angela, do we know what was written on Derek Chauvin's hands in the ink there? Well, we've been trying to get an answer to that all day uh, on our own, and I reached out to his law firm, and they didn't have any comment on that. But TMZ is reporting that, according to Eric Nelson, 
Derek Chauvin had written his phone number, Eric Nelson's phone number, on his palm because anything he had with him when he would take take it to prison would be confiscated for, from him. So obviously he wanted to be able to reach his lawyer and have that phone number handy. Okay. And Terry Austin, what was your reaction to seeing this 19-year police veteran taken away in handcuffs? You know, I think my reaction was a little different from when I heard the verdict. I think when everyone heard the verdict, they were jubilant and it was a sigh of relief. But it is difficult watching someone being taken off in handcuffs. I have to say, though, I think the jury made the right decision and they determined that he should go off to jail, that what he did was outrageous and that it should be something he should be held accountable for. And that means even as a police officer, he needs to serve his time. So it was the right decision. It may be hard to watch, but it definitely is the step in the right direction. That was the verdict. It was murder. So coming up on Law & Crime Daily, Derek Chauvin will be sentenced in two months and prosecutors are vowing to go for more than the maximum sentence. We'll tell you why. Plus, George Floyd's former girlfriend, Courtney Ross, is speaking out about Derek Chauvin's conviction. You'll hear what she has to say on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Prosecutors in the Derek Chauvin trial called the bystanders a bouquet of humanity. Many of those who testified are now speaking out. Darnella Fraser was just 17 years old when she recorded the video of George Floyd's death that was seen around the world. On the stand, Fraser said she had stayed up late at night apologizing to Floyd that she didn't do more, but knew Chauvin was ultimately at fault. After the verdict, Fraser posted this on Facebook. I just cried so hard. George Floyd, we did it. Justice has been served. And George Floyd's girlfriend, Courtney Ross, who testified about their struggle with opioid addiction, spoke to the crowd outside the courthouse about he, how he would have felt about the verdict. Though we are so diverse, we are also so separated. Minneapolis is one of the most diverse cities, yet we are segregated across this city in little pockets. I know it would be his dream to have this event bring us together. He has never been about divisiveness. He has always been about inclusiveness. I will say it over and over again. Floyd would not forget those who were forgotten. Terry, the bystanders were so important in this case, their testimony, their videos. What would this mean to the public at large? Will encourage others to get involved and be citizens looking for police going over the line, do you think? You know, let's hope so, because what these bystanders did was pivotal in this case. We saw Darnella Fraser's video, and it really changed the face of that trial. I believe that the jurors, at the end of the day, relied on that video and relied on her testimony and the testimony of others. So I hope that it makes other bystanders feel as though they can get involved. On the flip side of that, though, Brian, there's no question that police will be under more scrutiny, and each case does have to be viewed separately. We've seen cases like Dante Wright and Adam Toledo in Chicago, and just yesterday, the shooting of the 14-year-old Miyaka Bryan in Columbus, Ohio. And those cases are different, but let's just hope that in those cases and in all the other cases where we have this sort of police activity, that bystanders will get involved, they will be interested, they will come to court, and they will testify. And Brian Buckmeyer, for the bystanders in this case, it's not really over for them, is it? Aren't they likely to be called to testify in the trial of the three other officers who were there on the scene when they go to trial this August? Yeah, it's, de it's definitely likely, and I think based on their performance, the way they were received by many in the jury, they'll be definitely called as star witnesses. I think you're going to see uh, even sharper testimony. Uh, don't forget that many of them were cross-examined by Eric Nelson, and he made it a point, in fact, uh, to Mr. Williams, especially, to say that he was angry. He responded by saying he was in his body. Uh, Ms. Hansen, also her testimony was strong. Her cross-examination was very pointed as well to try to get her to be flustered in any way, shape, or form. I think they both did 
uh, an amazing job in terms of cross-examination. I would expect that they would come back for the next trial and be even stronger. Is definitely something I know that three defendants in Minnesota are thinking about and weighing out their options as they are expected to go on trial in August. Without a doubt. So when we come back, could Derek Chauvin be facing more time than the maximum sentence allowed? Everything you need to know about how much time he'll spend in prison. That's next. Derek Chauvin is set to be sentenced in eight weeks sometime in June and could go to prison for decades if prosecutors get their way. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here to explain how prosecutors say they're seeking to get a sentence longer than under the guidelines. Anjanette? Yeah, that's right, Brian. And you may have noticed that during the trial, the prosecution called several children to testify about very similar facts. And that was by design, because the testimony of the children could help determine Derek Chauvin's sentence. First of all, uh, would you tell us how old you are? Nine. At that time, Memorial Day of last year, how old were you then? Seventeen. One by one, children took the stand to testify about what they saw the night George Floyd died. Tell us what happened after you saw the ambulance come. Yes, the ambulance had to push him off of him. Did you notice anything about what Mr. Chauvin was doing with his body? Yes, at one point I saw him put more and more weight onto him. Prosecutors filed a notice last year to seek an upward sentencing departure, meaning they'll ask for a longer sentence than allowed by law. The fact that the crime happened in front of children is one of the reasons why a longer sentence may be sought. The judge can depart downward, but he cannot depart upward unless uh, a jury makes certain findings. But in this case, attorney Eric Nelson asked Chauvin after closing arguments whether he would waive his Blakely rights and have Judge Cahill, not the jury, decide whether the state proved aggravating factors existed. I'm willing to waive it and have Judge Cahill decide on those issues. Former Hennepin County Public Defender Mary Moriarty says Judge Cahill could increase the prison sentence, but it's not a given. Of course, if the judge gives an upward departure, that would be a ground for appeal. And the state wants to make sure they have a really good record establishing each basis for a departure. Now, the state of Minnesota sentences people based on guidelines, meaning there's a range of sentences that could be given, unlike other states that have set sentences for certain crimes. There's a scoring system that's used based on a defendant's criminal record that helps in determining the number of years he or she should receive. And both the state and the defense will be submitting briefs to Judge Cahill, arguing for both a longer and a shorter sentence. Brian? Thanks, Anjanette. Anjanette Levy in Minneapolis. And Judge Peter Cahill explained to Derek Chauvin after the verdict how the next few weeks will work as the attorneys prepare their briefs for sentencing. With the guilty verdicts returned, we're going to have uh, Blakely, you may file a uh, written argument as to Blakely factors within one week. The court will issue findings on the Blakely factors, the factual findings, one week after that. We'll order a PSI immediately, returnable in four weeks. And we will also have a briefing on, after you get the PSI, six weeks from now, and then eight weeks from now, we will have sentencing. We'll get you the exact dates uh, in a scheduling order. Is there a motion on behalf of the state? Your Honor, the state would move to have the court uh, revoke the defendant's bail and remand him into custody uh, pending sentencing. Bail is revoked, bond is discharged, and the defendant is remanded to the custody of the Hennepin County Sheriff. And Brian Buckmeyer, however much time Derek Chauvin spends in prison behind bars, time for a police officer in prison is doubly hard, isn't it? 
It definitely is. Uh, they're going to have to put him in protective custody. I cannot see him being in general population. It's just going to be difficult based on where he is. And I think that's something that Derek Chauvin knew and understood. And I think that's why, uh, if you recall, he wanted to do the 10 years if he could plead guilty to the murder in the third degree or a lesser charge, but only if it was done in federal prison. I think it's not only a danger for him to be in prison, but also to be in danger in a prison uh, in a state or a county where he may have put a lot of people in that prison. Uh, so they're definitely going to make sure to protect him at all times when he's there. And Terry Austin, in addition to the aggravating factors that Anjanette talked about with the presence of the minors, are there other aggravating factors that the judge will take into consideration? And how does he decide? You know, it's interesting. He's going to look at the facts of this case. And yes, there are other aggravating factors where we might see this sentence go up. One of them is the fact that the individual was handcuffed and he was particularly vulnerable. And we know for a fact that he was in the prone position and that he was handcuffed and that people were on his back and on his neck. So the judge will look at that. And they're going to look at also whether or not there was cruelty involved and whether Chauvin actually abused his authority. So the judge is going to consider all of that in addition to the fact that this all occurred in front of children, and we heard that those children obviously came to testify. So the judge is looking at a number of factors which is going to help him make his determination as to the facts, and then he will apply the law to those facts. And Terry, Chauvin did not testify during the trial. Can he testify during the sentencing phase? I don't think he will here. I think for the very reasons that he said it's up to the judge to determine whether or not these aggravating factors will come into play. It seems as though he has resigned himself to the fact that whatever has gone on in trial is going to be the determining factors. So I think we're going to just see the judge make a decision here. And in eight weeks, we're going to have a determination as to how many years exactly Tobin will be spending in jail. And once again, all eyes will be on the Hennepin County Courthouse in June when the sentencing is announced. All right, Brian and Terry, thank you so much. And thanks all of you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.